Good afternoon and welcome to this session on the science of citizen science. My name is Marcia Mazzonetto and I am project manager at the European Citizen Science Association. I'm going to chair this session today. Um, I hope you had a nice uh, coffee break and you also managed to stretch out a little bit in the yoga session that uh, just uh, finished. Um, we are going to have four speakers in this session today. Uh, each speaker is going to speak for around 15 minutes. We will have time for questions and answers at the end of each presentation. So please, if you have any questions, do write them in the chat during the presentation, each presentation, and we will do our best to have the time to answer to as many as possible. And the session will last in total one hour. So I'm going to stop this introduction as quickly as I can, as we have a very short time uh, available for the presentation. So I'm going to call uh, the first speaker for today, who is Heidi Bayard. Um, Heidi, welcome on the screen. Uh, uh, Heidi is a professor of environmental science education, and she's also faculty director of the Center for Community and Citizen Science in the School of Education at the University of California in Davis. Welcome, Heidi. And she is going to uh, give a presentation about the participation in citizen science and science identity, examining the many aspects of science identity across six projects in the US. Thank you and welcome, Heidi. Thank you very much. So I believe my screen is shared. Um, I am, uh, you've, you've given me my title slide. So I really appreciate the chance to speak with everyone today. And um, let's see, to advance the slides, there we go. I just wanted to mention the Center for Community and Citizen Science we have at UC Davis, where we have quite a few researchers and graduate students and um, affiliates working with us to build out from research to um, hit these four different sort of impact areas of civic action, science learning, innovative science, and conservation and management. So today I'll be talking about science learning. And I also thought it would be useful to just because there are so many terms out there uh, for citizen science and its ilk is to explain that um, there's quite a, a lot of baggage with the term citizen science, and um, but the term community science also means something very particular for a lot of environmental justice groups and uh, groups that have been calling themselves community science for a while. So that's why we uh, call the center and that's why I refer, like to refer to community and citizen science because it's acknowledging that there's a lot of community driven um, science that happens as well as uh, the more contributory citizen science we often talk about. Um, so uh, today I'm specifically focused on learning outcomes from citizen science and community science. And uh, some of you might be familiar with this particular uh, diagram, this notion that um, Tina Phillips and colleagues at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology worked on for quite a while to come up with the evaluation of all these different things, all these different sort of proposed outcomes that we think people might learn through uh, participating in citizen science um, in terms of science learning. And so uh, one thing they found, I, we worked together on this project I'm about to present on, is that identity was a really important outcome that was identified, but is very hard to nail down, very hard to define with respect to developing survey scales, which is what they were working towards on that project. So we have a lot of evidence of these different outcomes, content, knowledge, reasoning, skills, even interest and motivation, uh, a lot of research on that, but not as much on um, identity. And that's an emerging area to, examine and um, citizen science learning outcomes. So uh, what does this mean, right? What is this science identity or identity with respect to science? Um, it's how you see yourself. It's how you want to be seen. It's who you want to be in the future. Um, and with science, uh, so that G is sort of the standard on thinking about identity in learning and education. Um, and the citations are short below. But um, with respect to science, it's about like, do you see yourself as someone who understands and uses science? Um, and that uh, it, that impacts who you wanna be in the world, uh, if it involves science, um, what you decide to take up, how you approach problems. So identity is a really important 
um, feature that we might be really interested in and thinking about what people get out of participation in citizen science. So um, there's a lot of sort of propositions about that, that doing authentic science and working with real scientists should actually help people identify more with science. Um, the idea of communities of practice and things like that. Um, and uh, developing or reinforcing is this idea that it isn't just about zero to lots. It's uh, some people may already be identifying with uh, science and when they participate in citizen science, it gets reinforced and other people may be very new or really not identify with science and participation might really show them this way that they might identify themselves with science. So, um, that that's an important distinction. And there's lots of other propositions that I won't actually get to address today, but this idea that through more parts, participation in more parts of the scientific process, people might identify more and in different ways with science. And also just simply the more time, the more intensively, the, the more participation that someone might have might impact how well they identify with science. Um, so, uh, Across, we asked on this project, and I will describe it in just a second, how um, across a range of citizen science projects, how do participants see themselves in relation to science through their participation in the project? And how does that compare to their everyday life? How did they, you know, in what ways did they already identify with science or not? And how does it compare across engagement levels in terms of their time and intensity of participation? So this was a project that I did in joint collaboration with the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, Tina Phillips and Rick Bonney. And um, Tina's already published, uh, lead. Uh, we've already published Tina leading a paper on sort of defining engagement in citizen science from this project and um, did a lot of work on with surveys using those uh, different learning outcomes that you saw in the original sort of pie chart diagram. But um, my part of the project is to focus on identity. And so um, we had six, pro six large citizen science or community science programs that happen across the country. Some of these might be familiar. Uh, the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project and Nest Watch from the Cornell Lab are the more contributory projects. We had more collaborative projects where people were involved in some parts of the process besides data collection, but not that, you know, but just sort of interpretation. Um, uh, Coco Ross is one of them, the rain, hail, and snow monitoring network, and then co-created projects, two that were Alarm as a water quality monitoring and sort of focused organization, and Global Community Monitors was an air quality focused, um, both of them quite concerned with environmental justice. So uh, I and my team, my graduate student team, did 230 interviews with 70 people over four years across those six projects. And so... Um, just briefly, we did, you know, they were an hour long or more phone interviews with people. Uh, we worked with the program leaders to select people at different en engagement levels. And we had, we used what became this sort of in dimensions of engagement that we published about um, to sort of determine this sort of basic, moderate and high levels of engagement with all these different dimensions. Um, and uh, asked people questions like, you know, please just start to tell me about a typical day when you're when you're doing this project. And then do you see yourself as someone who understands or uses science and how? And do you think participating in a project has changed the way you see yourself as someone who understands or uses science? And we did that with quite a few questions. And um, I mean, with quite a few aspects of science identity. And um, this is where we, uh, these are some of the, the big codes that we used in realizing an important point I, I didn't mention earlier is that um, a, most of the research on science identity right now in education really focuses on whether someone wants to be a scientist, whether someone feels like they are a scientist, quote unquote, a scientist. And we knew that there was a lot more than that. There's, uh, I'm sure all of you who are working in this field know that there are a lot of nuances to that and it's not just about feeling like a scientist. So we found these really different aspects of identifying with science. So someone might feel like they are someone who uses or does science, someone who, um, there's a lot of research out there on recognition and identity and so being recognized by others as understanding or doing science. 
And one thing we really wanted to get at was this idea of seeing yourself as part of uh, the scientific community, because citizen science might actually be a particular um, influencer of that. We also looked at these other aspects um, about communicating and teaching science. We found in the interviews, people raised that, that they maybe perhaps didn't see themselves as doing science, but they saw themselves as communicating science to others and teaching. So um, what's important to know is that we had to really look hard at these interviews um, because we had prompted uh, these specific things above in white, you can, you can see there, but um, people hedged. We, we asked explicitly, do you feel this way or not? And sometimes people said, well, yeah, I suppose so, maybe, sort of. So we did not want to count that as, you know, really having this strong sense of that aspect of identity. So we had a lot of hedging and certainty. So we coded according to that. And I want to tell you about what we found. And so these are sort of the certain results. Um, these are the, I'm sorry, these are the people that were certain about saying, I see myself as someone using or doing science. So um, in this case, that first aspect, uh, 57 people out of the 71 um, or 80% of the people were certain about, they said, yes, and let me tell you about how I feel like I am someone who does or uses science. But th this is the, the trajectory of the story here. What we saw is that a large majority of people already felt that way, regardless of the project. And some people felt like that also because of the project participation they were doing. But then in um, only a few instances did people not feel that way before in their everyday life, but they did feel that way because of the project. And that's true also for, oops, trying to advance the slide. Um, uh, that's true also for the sort of corollary question, which is, do you think others see you that way too? Do you think that uh, you are recognized as someone who does or uses science? How do other, you identify because partly of the way other people see you? So same pattern, many, many people already felt that other people saw them as that kind of a person, as someone who does science. Um, and, um, the, I want to read you a quote, but uh, I have a feeling I won't have time. So here's the interesting punchline. And when we, because when we got to the scientific community question, the question about if you see yourself as part of the scientific community because of this project, as part of this project, the pattern completely switched. Most people did not see themselves in any other part of their life as part of the scientific community, but did see themselves very much more as part of the scientific community uh, through citizen science. And so the um, quote I can say is someone said, yes, I feel a part of the scientific community because when you collect your data, you can also see where all the other data is being collected. It's not that data that's just in your little town. It's basically potentially from all over the world and all the way from Mexico to Canada. So that's someone who's really seeing their participation in the project as part of this larger scientific effort. Um, so we found these other, I'm not sure what my time is, but we found these other aspects as well, where people sort of, um, what's interesting to say is actually we asked about contributing to science. Do they feel like as they are someone who contributes to science and only a little over half actually sort of stated that very firmly. Other people really hedged. So I think there's a lot of hesitancy on the part of a lot of these participants to claim like great significant impacts in the scientific world, like being part of the community is different from claiming that you're contributing something great. And I feel like that's an important point, this humility factor for people. Um, and I wanna kind of get into that some more. Some of this um, important things we saw that uh, I'm not gonna go into is the ways that previous science background certainly influenced the weather, science identity was developed and whether people were doing it because they were curious about nature, like the bird projects in some cases, or they're really worried and concerned, like in the environmental justice projects, that influenced how much they identified with the science. People that were really feeling like their data was helping their community were very much um, felt like identity, uh, their, their identity increased. So I'm going to fast forward to the conclusions to say, um, 
that science identity is much more complex than just identifying as a scientist. And that maybe this, uh, many people who do citizen science were already feeling like they identify with science, but the value added of citizen science participation might be in the scientific community, um, in, in their sense of feeling a part of the scientific community. So that's it, thank you very much. Thank you very right, much. Yeah. I'm really sorry for having to stop you because no. it's, it's extremely interesting, the research you have been doing, and there are some really interesting comments in the chat. I think everyone is really impressed by the data set that you have been collecting, oh, and you. everyone is really looking forward to know more. I think you will have a lot of people get in touch with you. And someone is saying, I hope you didn't have to transcribe it all. And I was actually, I was actually thinking the same when I was listening to the to the, uh, you talking about the, the amazing research that you have been doing. Um, someone you. is asking actually, one quick question maybe. Um, so again, what an amazing set of interviews. Will you be sharing it in some anonymized form? And that was uh, Mukli asking this uh, question. Sharing the interviews in an anonymized form? Well, you know, we that's a really good question because we also partnered quite closely with these citizen science program leaders, right? The project leaders, and they're very interested in, right, hearing the words of their participants. So we've been working on ways to try to anonymize it um, case by case, project by project, like here's what these participants from this project said. And so um, it's really good to hear that others would be interested in that. Um, and if anyone has suggestions about how best to get that out into the world that's not a journal article, right? Because that's not the place. Um, and uh, in a way that would certainly protect the identity of people, but still let uh, let the let a lot of people see these comments. So if anyone has suggestions about alternate forms of publishing, I suppose just a website thing, but a blog. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Heidi. And I think maybe while Bradley, our next speaker, joins us on the screen, I can ask you just where, no. Too late. Okay, gone. <laughs> I think, Heidi, we will be sharing with you some more questions quickly. Um, uh, just, there's a really interesting question very quickly. So, do you know if any of the participants, just a yes or no, very quickly, have become a professional scientist after participating in a citizen science process? Yes. Okay. But, right. and but that's because a lot of them were thinking about it beforehand and this okay. really got them into the groove and they decided to, to pers keep pursuing it. Um, so yes, yeah. okay. a few. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. And there are lots of very interesting questions, but unfortunately we don't have time to, to go to them. So I think our next speaker and, and Heidi, you will be receiving all the questions uh, after the, the presentation so that uh, maybe you can try and get in touch with the people who have been asking questions and see if you can give some answers. Um, we should have our next speaker with us now. Um, the next speaker is Bradley Alf, hi Bradley, um, who is a um, third year PhD student in the public science cluster at the North Carolina State University. Welcome Bradley. And uh, I think it's really good for both you and Heidi that this session is in the afternoon, so that it's a quite <laughs> decent time, I think, yeah. where you are based. Um, so, okay, I think everything is working now. I don't know if you have shared your screen already, but if not, please do so. Fantastic. Okay, now uh, to you, Bradley, for your presentation. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and I think we can see my screen here, but somebody let me know if you can. Um, so, yes, my name is Bradley. Uh, I'm a third year PhD student at NC State. Um, and I'm going to be talking to you all today about SciStarter and in general, what we know about the impact of SciStarter, or we're calling a third-party citizen science platform on volunteer communities. <clears throat> and so as a lot of us may be aware, citizen science uh, is, is growing. Um, for example, we see uh, a lot of growth in the number of biodiversity-related citizen science projects. Um, as this graph is showing, um, Projects. There are more projects today than there have been in the past. Uh, participation rates in citizen science uh, are growing. Uh, and, and with that, we're seeing some new means of engaging with citizen science. Um, so while certain projects like the Christmas Bird Count or the Ontario Butterfly Atlas have been around for quite a long time, it's only in the last 10 years or so that we've seen 
uh, what we're calling uh, third-party citizen science platforms come about. And so these are websites uh, like Zooniverse, SciStarter, uh, just this year, the EU citizen science website. Um, and these are sort of global uh, repositories for citizen science projects, or, or they are resources for citizen scientists more generally. Um, and importantly, they're sort of project agnostic. They're spaces where people can go outside of a, a standalone citizen science project uh, to enga instead engage sort of across citizen science more broadly. Um, <clears throat> and so the, the guiding question, what we're going to be talking about uh, today is, is what is the impact of that shift uh, in people's engagement with citizen science uh, on the volunteer communities that are engaging with citizen science? <clears throat> and uh, we're going to be focusing uh, on SciStarter, uh, which is the website that is the focus uh, of my graduate research. And so SciStarter um, is a repository of citizen science projects. Uh, there are about 1,300 different projects listed on the site right now that project owners um, uh, list on, on the website. And prospective volunteers can visit SciStarter and search um, the database based on keyword, by topic, by projects that are near to them geographically. More recently, um, dashboards have been created on SciStarter where participants can track their contributions to certain projects. They can um, join projects, they can bookmark projects. Um, and it, it's sort of a central area for citizen scientists to keep track of their participation uh, in, in the projects that they're involved in. Um, also, more recently, SciStarter has enabled um, outside organizations to host pages on SciStarter. So, for example, National Geographic has a page on SciStarter um, where people that are affiliated with them can join a curated list of projects um, that they've specifically chosen um, to be included um, on their page. And But it's not just National Geographic. There are um, um, Girl Scout troops, there are schools, there are even corporations that are all creating pages on SciStarter. And so we, uh, in, in pursuit of trying to understand how that growth in, in third party engagement on SciStarter might be impacting volunteers, um, we were interested in comparing um, volunteers that engage with projects, um, that engage in sort of standalone projects, so the project as it exists on its own um, and comparing them to volunteers that are engaging uh, on one of these platforms, in this case, SciStarter. Um, so for this research, we surveyed members of the Christmas Bird Count project, which is a standalone project uh, focused on tracking um, uh, birds over time, uh, as well as volunteers from North Carolina's Candid Critters project, which is a project uh, it, within the US state of North Carolina where people um, do uh, camera trapping for, for mammals. And then we compared uh, what we learned from those surveys to surveys of, to a survey of volunteers on SciStarter as well as digital trace data gathered from the volunteers on SciStarter. So the, the sort of digital remnants of how they're engaging with the projects, what they're clicking on, um, what they're contributing to, that kind of thing. <clears throat> uh, and so the first thing we did is we looked at all of the different projects that people said that they were joining in the surveys or were clicking on in the digital trace data and then broke up each volunteer based uh, on what projects they joined. So for instance, um, there, was, uh, there were people that joined just a single project, which is the black bars here, people that were what we're calling specialists, which are people that joined multiple citizen science projects, but all within one disciplinary topic, so like astronomy or ecology. And then there were boundary spanners, which are people that joined projects from multiple disciplinary topics. So somebody that joined, say, an astronomy project and an ecology project. And what we found uh, were that the, the standalone projects uh, tended to have less diverse engagement in projects uh, than the volunteers that we studied from SciStarter. Uh, so for the Candid Critters project, we saw the bulk of participation uh, was within just a single project. So most people were just joining Candid Critters. Within Christmas Bird Count, we see that most people, uh, most of the volunteers were specialists. So participating in multiple projects, uh, but all within the ecology discipline, um, uh, with, with which Christmas Bird Count is. Uh, and then within the SciStarter data, we see 
um, much more, uh, the, the boundary spanning is, is much more common. So people that are joining projects from across uh, different disciplinary topics. And we see something similar when we break up uh, the projects joined by these volunteers based on the modality of participation. Um, so in this case, we're defining that as participating uh, in online projects or offline projects. So an offline project would be something with a field component where you have to go outside uh, to collect or analyze data, for instance. Uh, whereas an online project is something that you can do entirely uh, online. And we see in our standalone projects that we survey, the Chris's bird count and candid critters, we see that offline participation is almost ubiquitous. Um, and we should note that, of course, Chris's bird count and candid critters are both themselves offline projects. Uh, whereas the, the volunteers we sampled on SciStarter, um, we see more diverse modal engagement where there's uh, where it's much more common to participate in both online and offline projects or to participate only in online projects. <clears throat> and so drilling down a little more tightly, um, we can see what the specific projects are and the disciplinary topics and subtopics that people are doing in these little colorful donut charts we made. Um, and so we see that um, within our standalone projects, the Chris's bird count and candid critters, the bulk of participation is in ecology projects. Uh, in the case of Chris's bird count, it's almost entirely in these four other bird projects besides the Chris's bird count. Um, participation is, is slightly more diverse among Candid Critters volunteers, uh, but again, we see mostly ecology projects. Uh, within that, mostly bird projects, which is sort of interesting because Candid Critters is itself a mammal project. Um, some multi-taxa projects like iNaturalist, that kind of thing. Um, but if we compare that to the projects people are joining on SciStarter, um, we see that the, the SciStarter volunteers are engaging uh, in these much more diverse disciplinary topics. So we see uh, that participating in health and medicine projects is more common, pollution projects, astronomy, um, that kind of thing. Um, of course, the, the bulk, the, about half of participants are still engaging in ecology projects, um, which is still the most common topic. Um, but we do see more diverse engagement even within ecology um, where projects focused on like invertebrates and uh, reptiles and amphibians, that kind of thing are, are more common here. And so the last thing we did um, is then we took out um, the volunteers from the SciStarter survey that participated in one of our standalone projects, in this case, the Christmas bird count. So there were 31 people in our SciStarter survey um, that participated in the Christmas bird count. And so we looked specifically at what projects, uh, at the diversity of projects they were doing and compared it to the projects that were joined joined by the people we sampled from the Christmas bird count. It's a little confusing, but so we're comparing our original um, survey of Christmas bird count volunteers to a subset of volunteers from the SciStarter survey that had participated in the Christmas bird count. Um, and again, we see a, a striking difference in um, the kinds of projects that people are joining, where the Christmas bird count volunteers that engaged through SciStarter were more likely to be um, boundary spanners and to be participating in, in multiple um, modes in both online and offline projects. So to return to our guiding question, what is the impact of third-party citizen science platforms on volunteer communities? Um, well, it seems that they may be driving volunteers to engage in more diverse citizen science experiences. Um, so what is the significance of that? Um, so the last thing we, we did is we looked at um, whether these different participation patterns are linked to outcomes that we're interested in that we also assessed in these surveys. So looking at volunteers in the Christmas bird count survey, for instance, uh, we broke them up again into people that did just a single project, people that were specialists, and people that were boundary spanners. Um, and this, these are odds ratios being displayed down here. Um, uh, where the, the neutral position is, is a specialist doing multiple bird projects. And we see that it's often the case that these boundary spanners have higher learning outcomes, significantly higher learning outcomes in things like environmental stewardship, environmental efficacy, science efficacy, that kind of thing, um, compared to people that are just doing a, a single disciplinary topic or doing um, just a single project. So the significance of this finding perhaps is that more diverse engagement in citizen science on platforms could be facilitating deeper learning and or engagement in science and conservation 
um, if participating sort of more broadly within the citizen science field um, is linked to um, uh, higher achievement of learning outcomes, which um, we are seeing some evidence that is the case. So the next steps for us are, are trying to get at something that's not so associative. Um, and so within SciStarter, we have the capacity to design quasi-experimental studies that could get closer to assessing causality. Um, so I mentioned earlier groups like National Geographic that are building pages on SciStarter. Uh, in addition to um, National Geographic, which you know is uh, obviously uh, tailored towards people with some kind of pre-existing interest in science and that kind of thing. There are also corporations that are interested in engaging in SciStarter and building these pages where volunteers might not come from uh, sort of a, a self-selecting background like Nat Geo volunteers would be. So for instance, corporations like Verizon, uh, you know, a telecommunications company are allowing their employees to get volunteer hours by participating in a page on SciStarter. And so through that, we can sort of um, uh, adjust what projects are being um, offered to these volunteers, um, you know, perhaps just one project or perhaps projects all within one disciplinary topic or projects uh, across multiple disciplines. And we can see um, how uh, altering what projects are available to volunteers might be linked to, to different outcomes. And it will also allow us to track volunteers across their citizen science experience. Um, so perhaps somebody that has no interest in the environment might be more interested uh, in joining a project like Stall Catchers. Um, uh, but then through that, Stall Catchers might lead to more diverse engagement in other disciplinary topics, uh, perhaps like an environmental project like iNaturalist. Um, so in conclusion, I'm, I'm really sorry to stop sorry. you, Bradley. Yeah. Do you think you can maybe wrap up in 15 seconds? Yeah, so these are my conclusions here. Third parties are an emerging form of engagement uh, with citizen science. Volunteers using third parties are engaging in more diverse types of citizen science than traditional volunteers. Um, they're engaging new audiences. And we think that by embracing shared management of volunteers through third parties, managers and researchers may be better positioned to inspire stewardship uh, and social change. And that's all. Thank you very much, Bradley. I'm really sorry I had to stop you. Uh, there are some interesting questions in the chat. Maybe after this presentation, you can connect to the Vimeo channel and maybe answer directly to, to the question in, in directly in the chat. I'm really sorry we have to stop now. Otherwise, it, we will be late for the next presentation. But thank you very much. That was really interesting. Thanks. So I would like to invite the next speaker uh, on, the, uh, on the screen. Uh, our next speaker is Mohamed Karisifat. I am not sure I'm pronouncing your last name right, so please do say your full name if you would like. I'm really sorry about that. Uh, who is a postdoctoral researcher in citizen science uh, at the Department of Hydroinformatics and Social Technical Innovation at the IHE Delft Institute for Water Education in the Netherlands. And Mohamed is going to talk to us about an analysis of the contextual realities of community-based environmental monitoring initiatives in Kenya and the Netherlands. Welcome, Mohamed, and now the screen is yours. Thank you very much uh, for the nice introduction. And indeed, you pronounced the family name uh, very good. It's a difficult one. Uh, so I'm going to, to start with the presentation. Uh, I'm wondering if you can uh, see my screen? Yes, it works. It works. Okay. It works well. Yeah. Okay, great. So I will uh, start immediately. Uh, the talk that I've prepared for today um, is about a study that we did on analyzing the contextual realities uh, in which we uh, established two community-based monitoring initiatives, one in Kenya and the other one in the Netherlands. Now, uh, these two initiatives were established as a part of a project uh, called Ground Truth 2.0. Some of you may, uh, may have heard about the project. It was an EU-funded project running between 2016 and 2019. Now, the results of this research that I'm presenting today have already been published in, in two journal papers that I will introduce later on in the presentation. Now, uh, in Ground Truth, uh, we used a co-design approach uh, to, to, to design uh, what we call citizen observatories 
or community monitoring initiatives. And these were uh, really about, uh, let's say, facilitating collaboration and information exchange between three main categories of stakeholders. So citizens, scientists, and policymakers. Now in this picture, you read uh, data aggregators. Th those are uh, actually, yeah, what we refer to as scientists. And as we know, uh, this collaboration and information exchange doesn't happen in a void. Uh, so there are certain social, environmental, technological, institutional, and financial contexts um, in which uh, these initiatives operate in and with which they interact. So without understanding this context, it's, it's really hard to think about the design and, and let's say, establishment of, of these initiatives. Now, ground truth, uh, as I said, used the code approach, uh, and it has six demo cases, uh, four uh, in Europe and two in Africa. Uh, and the cases in Europe uh, were uh, actually in Spain, uh, in the Netherlands, in Sweden, and in Belgium. And we had two African cases, one in Zambia and the other one in Kenya. Uh, now, uh, in this talk, I'm going to focus on the contextual analysis of two cases, the one in the Netherlands and the other one in Kenya. Um, so in this slide, you, you see, uh, let's say, the uh, geographical location of the two cases. The Kenyan case is located in, uh, in the Mara ecosystem uh, in the Kenyan side, so actually Masai Mara National Reserve, which is which is a very famous, uh, uh, let's say, biodiversity reserve, is is located in the case, and there are also conservancies around this this reserve, which is which all are located in the Narok County in Kenya, and the other case, uh, which is the Dutch case, is located in in Altena, a location uh, in in a province uh, in in the Netherlands called Nor North Brabant. And this area actually has faced quite a lot of incidents of pluvial flooding, so floods uh, that that are caused by intense rainfalls. Now, uh, about the mission and vision, you can read, of course, the vision and mission on the slide. But to summarize, the mission of the Masai Mara Citizen Observatory was to create a multi-stakeholder uh, platform for generating and sharing data, information, and knowledge to improve policymaking and decision-making uh, that, that creates a more sustainable livelihood and biodiversity management for the area. Uh, in Hrip of Water, uh, yeah, the, the idea was to uh, create an online and offline environment where uh, information, knowledge about pluvial flooding and weather information can be shared. And by this sharing information, of course, communication between these diff three different categories of actors, shapes, and, and then, yeah, they can, they can better manage the, the problem. Uh, now, about the, uh, how we did this, uh, the contextual analysis, uh, we employed uh, a, a framework, a conceptual framework that was developed uh, in, in this project called the CPI framework. Uh, as the name represents, it's uh, suitable for both context analysis, uh, process evaluation, and impact assessment. And uh, the framework, as you can see in the picture, has uh, five uh, different dimensions. Uh, goals and objectives, uh, which is uh, all about the goals of the initiative and also the actor-specific uh, objectives so of the participants. A technology that is about uh, yeah the technological the technological choices and also uh, yeah uh, whether they match the, the the existing infrastructure and and uh, and norms. Uh, then we have the participation dimension that uh, focuses on the question who participates and how. And then the power dynamics uh, dimension that is about the control and influence of different actors in the initiative. And finally, the results dimension that is about outputs, outcomes, and impacts. 
there are 22 aspects uh, overall in, in the framework that I'm not going to be able to introduce in detail. But I invite you, if you're interested, to look at this paper uh, um, that, was five, uh, that was published last year. I hope I get a chance to put a link uh, in, the, in the chat later on. And uh, there you can see the full details about the, the framework. Now, uh, for this research, we, uh, we only focused on the context-specific aspects of the framework. So on the picture on the right, you should be able to see yeah, the, the, the context-specific aspects of, of, of the framework. And in terms of data collection sources of data, we basically built the study on, on two major sources of data. One was uh, yeah, interviews, uh, 60 interviews that we did in the two cases, 26 in the Netherlands and 34 in Kenya. And these interviews were conducted in the beginning stages of the establishment of the, uh, of the initiatives, so in 2016 and 17. Uh, who did we talk to? We talked to, uh, on the picture on the left down, you see different categories of, of people that we talked to people from regulatory entities, uh, experts both on the science side and on the policy side. Uh, we talked to, the, of course, the members of the co-design uh, groups because we were co-designing these initiatives. And we also talked, about, uh, talked to the general public, so uh, members of the public who were not involved uh, in the initiative. Um, and uh, we also based our analysis a lot on the existing secondary data, so from scientific publication, uh, major laws, regulations, government reports, and so on. Now, uh, I will try to uh, give you a snapshot of the results in the, uh, in the remaining minutes. Uh, uh, on the participation dynamics, uh, if we uh, look at the Participa participation, the let's say the uh, ongoing participation paradigms uh, on the topics that we had the focus on, we can see that in the Dutch case, uh, yeah, public participation was not really a fundamental pillar of, of, of the Dutch democracy, if you will. And um, in the water management system in the Netherlands, it is not practiced. So there are uh, scientists from the water boards who, who make the decisions and make the choices uh, most often. In Kenya, uh, on the other hand, the public participation is a governance principle, so you see it in the constitution, in the new constitution of the Kenya and uh, lots of other legislations. Uh, but in practice, actually, both cases are the same. So uh, the role of the general public in decision-making processes about the issues that I highlighted uh, are very limited, and normally it's limited to electing representatives that then they go on and, and make the decisions on behalf of citizens. Uh, on the technology side, uh, I will give you a little bit of uh, insight into the results on the access to technology. So here we see really a, a classic example of north-south or developed versus developing country situation. So in the Netherlands, if you see, uh, if you look at the picture on the right hand side, this shows the IDI index or uh, uh, yeah, the ICT development index that shows uh, how well developed is ICT infrastructure and so on in a country. Uh, you see that uh, in, in the Netherlands, this, uh, this index at the country level is high and for Kenya, that's low. Uh, and uh, to add to that, uh, in, in the Kenyan case, we are also dealing with uh, a situation where the uh, average level of literacy and required skills to use the ICTs is, is much lower. And in the region that, that the case study was located, in the Narok County, it's actually even worse because the population is dispersed and the infrastructure is dispersed. So. Uh, yeah, the the uh, the access I would say uh, in that area is even lower than the average of the country. Um, now, on the power dynamics dimension, I, I chose uh, a little bit of insights in, into the results on the access to control and access to and control over data. Um, now. Uh, we can see that in both countries there are explicit legal rights. Uh, 
uh, about access to information for the general public. Access to data uh, is often controlled by organizations and individuals who collect the data. And, uh, but these laws and regulations are sometimes interpreted differently in, in the two countries. So in the Dutch case, uh, public authorities have really explicit deadlines to respond to, to the requests of, of the public for, for data. And denying access normally needs to uh, be justified with a clear reason. Now, in the Kenyan context, uh, there are a lot of data that are labeled as sensitive or exempt information. Uh, so these information uh, are not really easily shared with the public, and there are always excuses for not uh, sharing uh, some or, or all of the data. Um, I'm coming to the last slide. I don't know how I'm doing with the time. Uh, now, these are a few key messages or if you will take home messages uh, from this research. So we realized that an earlier stage contextual analysis can be very helpful for making informed decisions when we are designing and implementing citizen science initiatives. Uh, and uh, this earlier stage contextual analysis can later on be used uh, as, let's say, a point of reference for impact assessment, for measuring what we changed by, by establishing these initiatives. Uh, of course, this may be a very resource intensive exercise, but if the resources doesn't allow, uh, we, can, we can do it minimum. So we can use secondary sources of uh, data, desk research and so on. To, uh, to actually have a little bit of insight into the context. Uh, now, uh, the detailed results of, of this research uh, can be found in, in this publication. I will try again to put the link in the chat. Uh, and uh, yeah, this brings me to, to the end of the presentation. Thank you very much, Mama. That was really interesting. And there are some really interesting comments in the chat and also a few questions. So I think if you now probably connect to the Vimeo channel, you will be able to see them and also answer to some of the questions that appear there. I'm really sorry we don't have time now for questions, but thank you very much for Wonderful. this very interesting presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And we have now our last speakers for this session who is Christian Nielsen, uh, Associate Professor and Head of the Center of Science Studies at the Aros University in Denmark. Welcome um, to Christian. And uh, Christian is going to talk about uh, an enacting scientific citizenship in citizen science, a closer look at the notion of scientific citizenship and the construction of citizens and science in two Danish citizen science projects. Welcome Christian and now the microphone to you. Okay, thanks uh, very much, Marcia, and uh, thanks everyone for attending and for sticking uh, on to what must be the last uh, presentation of um, the EXA um, conference this year. So I'm going to talk about citizen science uh, and in relation to a related concept, uh, scientific citizenship, and I'm going to try to flesh out how that uh, or how scientific citizenship may be at work in um, uh, three Danish uh, citizen science uh, projects. So uh, here we go. Uh, the notion of citizen... Christian, can you, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Can you please share your screen so that everyone can see sorry. your presentation? No problem. <laughs> sorry. I know it's uh, very complex with these online events. Yes. So, okay. Uh, and can you see it now? Yes, it works. It's working perfectly fine. Thank you. Okay. Good. Yes. So, <clears throat> as I was saying, uh, I'm I'm trying to look at scientific citizenship in the relation to specific s citizen science uh, projects, and uh, traditionally, there's three aspects of scientific citizenship that has been uh, developed uh, or looked at. Um, firstly, uh, the development of scientific uh, literacy or capacity building in relation to uh, science. There's also the question of environmental uh, awareness and even activism where citizens use science for their own uh, agendas and to um, take part in a sustainable or to encourage a sustainable development. And then there's also a, a relation to science policy making and technology assessment where 
citizens get to have a say in uh, defining and making decisions about science and, and technology. Uh, I also include a slide here on th the more, let's say, political notion of uh, citizenship, uh, where there's, there's also three dimensions that um, people typically look at, namely the identity and membership, the, the rights and the uh, the ability to participate and and take responsibility for society, and if you if you try to relate those three dimensions to science specifically, you can see it's about science identity. What uh, Heidi, in fact, explored in the first presentation in this uh, session, but it's also about the right to science, or rather the 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 right to uh, share in the benefits of science to. Um, to to access scientific information and to be able to use science for, for the different uh, purposes. And then finally, also the right to participate in science, which is very much what of course, citizen science is about, and to, um, to impact, to have an impact on, on, on scientific uh, developments. So here's a quote from Brigitte Nerlich, uh, who in a blog uh, a couple of years ago wrote about scientific citizenship, and she said, Scientific citizenship is the active and aware participation of citizens in the democratic processes in the knowledge society. Public decisions are more and more complex and involve highly specialized knowledge. To achieve better outcomes in decision-making processes, it's necessary to combine the knowledge of experts with citizens' knowledge and values. So scientific citizenship requires an open dialogue between science and citizens and transparency in information and knowledge exchange. So I'm going to just follow up on this scientific citizenship, or at least Nerlik points to the fact that scientific citizenship is very uh, closely related to uh, democracy. And you can you can think about democracy in in, in different ways. Of course, uh, there's the, the question of informed citizens uh, delegating their power to politicians and perhaps even also to scientists to produce a reliable knowledge, but also deliberating and participating in decision making through debate and, and discussion. But there's also the other side of the coin, so to speak, that uh, institutions such as scientific institutions, of course, needs to have or to show some kind of uh, accountability and inclusiveness in order to be uh, recognized as democratic institutions uh, to build on, on transparency, openness and ongoing a composition, ongoing decision making about what what is really the purpose of, of doing science. Okay, so I'm going to try for the rest of the talk, I'm going to try to take these um, uh, aspects of scientific citizenships and try to, to think about them in relation to three different uh, citizen science projects in Denmark. Uh, so this is in Danish, I'm not asking you to, to, uh, to read or understand it. Uh, this is a traditional Biodiversity uh, Citizen Science Project in Denmark, actually the largest citizen science project in Denmark, where uh, citizens can uh, acquire an app for their, their smartphone and they can uh, register different species and different habitats uh, in Denmark. It, there's also a big outreach program uh, related to this. So schools are particularly encouraged, or school children are particularly encouraged to uh, participate to participate and participate. Sorry, uh, and there's a uh, there's also a program um, for boys, uh, boy and and girls scouts, as as you can see uh, here. So this contributory research project uh, in diversity is, I think, is very much if you relate it to to aspects of scientific citizenships, it's very much about civic uh, capacity building, plus building also an interest and and uh, trust in science. Um, that's, I think, the the primary uh, citizen scientific citizenship dimension of a project like this. Uh, of course, there's also the access to information. Uh, these people uh, who participate in the project they get access to biodiversity information and knowledge about biodiversity that uh, was uh, not available perhaps to them uh, as much uh, before they entered into the program. The second program I'm going to talk about is a political. It's a more a policy oriented program. It's a program that runs at the University of Southern Denmark uh, in uh, Den uh, yes, uh, in Denmark, of course. <laughs> uh, it's a project known as a healthier Southern uh, Denmark, 
And it's a project where uh, the researchers ask um, citizens in the region, so what kind of research do you think your local hospital should carry out? And the regional councils um, establish a fund of, of 2 million uh, Danish uh, kroner that, and they will be handed out to research projects that gets the most vote in the in the project. So, five research projects in the uh, in health research have been identified as as being uh, the candidates for this year's uh, competition. And then in October, there'll be a public competition where people can actually vote for what kind of or which of these five uh, research projects should should have um, should get the, uh, the money for doing their their research. It's also a media event. Uh, the media is involved and there's a big public show. This is from uh, last year where you can see a, a happy researcher uh, being handed a check of uh, one million uh, Danish uh, kroner. And it's also an outreach program uh, where uh, high schools, uh, Danish high schools, or some high schools get involved in uh, communicating these projects to a larger uh, audience. So if you want to think about this citizen science project um, as a, in terms of scientific uh, citizenship, I think it's again very much about capacity building and creating a kind of accountability for uh, health research. Um, people get to, um, to see, I mean, that decisions about priority and what kind of research should be carried out are made on an on a, on a, a almost daily basis on a, and, uh, and, and they get to participate also in this kind of uh, decision making, at least in, in a very, uh, in this particular uh, event. For the, for the young people here, it's about also access to information through uh, dissemination. And it's about getting the chance to talk science, right? These girls here, they've talked about uh, the scientific uh, project and they communicated it. So, so they get that, that kind of uh, capacity also to, to talk science. And, and deliberation and decision making. I think I, I, I hope I made that clear that that's also part of the the project. The last project I'm going to uh, talk about, and I was going to show a video here, but I think we'll leave it because we don't really uh, have much time. Uh, I'm hoping for one uh, or maybe two questions at the end. But this is a, a, an activist project in um, actually my home city, Aarhus. Uh, it's called City of the Species, and this is where a, a smaller group of uh, citizens. Uh, are engaging in locating the kind of scientific knowledge about different species in an urban environment and what are their uh, needs and demands. So in fact, they, they want to make the city a more biodiverse uh, place and they want the city planning also to accommodate for different kinds of species other than uh, us humans, of course. So they uh, they represent each of these people, they represent the species that, that live in the city uh, but and and has uh, other needs than than um, than humans. So so they want to communicate that kind of knowledge, and they want to find out what is specifically needed for these species, also to be part of the uh, urban planning and municipal planning in 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 Aarhus. So the, obviously, this is kind of an environmental activism, which I think again has this civic capacity building dimension, access to information and talking science, talking, uh, acquiring science, getting information and talking science to politicians. And it's about deliberation, access to decision making and taking an access in uh, or taking action in local policy making and urban planning. Okay, so summing up what does citizen science uh, through these three examples accomplish in terms of enacting uh, citizenship, I think you can actually find that the three dimensions of citizenship, membership, right to science, participation in the institution of science are all in different ways uh, apparent here in, in these different uh, projects. Of course, they're not all of them enacting all the, these dimensions, but at least you see the potential of citizen science to enact um, to the traditional or the classic uh, dimensions of uh, citizenship in relation to science, not in relation to the nation state, but in relation to, so this is scientific literacy. That's, I think it's important to, to bear in mind. And of course, the question we can all ask ourselves, are we doing enough and should we be doing more to enact scientific citizenship through uh, citizen science? That's all for me. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Christian. This was a really interesting presentation. I think maybe we have time for one question. 
Um, uh, so, uh, someone is asking, I would really like to understand how you assess if trust in science is affected by participating in the biodiversity citizen science uh, project. Maybe just in 15 seconds, if you can give just a very quick answer. <laughs> Yeah, okay, so I haven't made empirical research whether, and, and of course, that, that's really what could be needed, I mean, to go out and find out whether these dimensions that I suggest are really, have an impact in these, uh, so so that's, I think I was expressing the, the project's goal, <laughs> and I didn't make an uh, empirical statement whether that was um, uh, actually the case, so thanks for that. Thank you, Christian. And there are more comments and questions in the chat, so I'm sure that uh, we will share those with you and you will be able to address them uh, later on. Uh, now, I think we are over with this session. Uh, thank you very much to all the, the speakers and all the participants. And please remember that in uh, more or less 10 minutes, the closing uh, of the EXA conference is going to take place. So please do not miss our closing event starting in 10 minutes from now. Thank you very much to all the participants and also to the technical support uh, behind the scene. And have a really nice uh, rest of the day, evening or whatever, depending on where you are. Thank you very much and bye-bye.